Alright, walk and talk video. Yay. Except I don't really, not really clear on my subject. Two things. Uh, Laura Layla made a video about expectations. And expectations is a kind of an interesting word. Um, kind of applies the word context. You know, that your expectations <laughs> do change context. You know, how you're going to experience something kind of depends on how, what you're anticipating, what you're expecting, what you're hoping for, what you're Blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking about the economy stuff. And uh, I do want to make, you know, economic videos. I mean, I'll do videos on specific subjects and title them that way again and all that stuff, I think. Um, so I guess this, I don't know, if it would be an economics video or not. That's the problem. This video might not be, well, let's just say it is. All right, I'll get to the economics part. Um, yeah. Ugh. Uh, so that relates toward the modern mystic. Um, you know, he is sort of, I mean, he's clearly anti, I mean, the structure of the system is broken, but he's not so clearly something bad has to happen, which is kind of weird, or something majorly. I don't know, it's just hard to pin him down. Um, well, it's hard to, um, derive a context, <laughs> you know in the explicit context. So, you know, I haven't watched every one of his videos, so maybe I'm missing something where he said it quite clearly that these things are going to be inevitable and that this will happen. Something like that. But it's been a while since he's done that. And he sort of modified his beliefs sometimes without saying it explicitly. Well, anyway, now I'm really getting around to talking around the subject um but yeah i mean there's so many things that are like expectations you have to build into economics like you have to have some guesstimate about what the future is going to be and that'll decide how you behave now if it would have been up to me you know everything would have shut down years ago because i would have said oh, well it's got a crash there's, there's no way you can maintain this level of bad debt um, existing and just pretend it doesn't exist. But they have been able to pretend it doesn't exist uh, a lot longer than I thought they could and get away with it. Um, and so, you know, maybe there's another, maybe there's more I'm not anticipating, I'm not seeing, so I don't have the expectation. Uh, and so, yeah, <laughs> I have a different context that I'm looking at the world through. Um, but the fact that I have been unreliable uh, in my past predictions of doom, uh, maybe I, you know, anything I say in this video is going to be horseshit. Uh, the bottom line is that there seems to be this obvious problem where the number of people who hold the assets is decreasing and the number of people who, you know, owe assets are increasing. So more people are in debt to fewer and fewer people. And the problem with that is is that there's a point where people who have assets will not be on people that have really no prospect of paying them back. Um, you know, where there's no, you know, the bankruptcy rate is so high or the something else where you're going to lose it all, too. You're not going to just lose a portion of your uh, risk capital but you're going to lose all of it. I mean, I'm sure there's mega rich people that make deals, you know, when they buy stock, that they get out first, you know, with the market. You know, that the worst they can do is lose 10% of the value of their investment uh, because they're guaranteed some sort of safe harbor from any kind of climactic uh, circumstance. And that's the whole, I guess, the whole premise behind diversification is that it provides you insurance against, you know, a total loss. Um, some insurance. But, you know, in realistically pretty reliable insurance. Anyway, it's not exactly the point I wanted to make, but it just seems like there's this dynamic that exists. And you know that some debt, you know, unresolvable debt, so could certainly exist in an economy because it would just be a piece of paper 
and it would just float around as a piece of surplus and uh, people would trade it and all that would change is who explicitly is the owner of it but I mean it would just remain an asset paper uh, so there's two problems first there's why would rich people invest in bad economies like why would a rich why if you had a billion dollars why, why would you buy a US bond um, because the money you pay for it with today will inevitably uh, just outright obviously be worth less I mean the money will be worth is more valuable than the money you'll be paid back three years from now so if you bought a three-year bond at uh, one point four or five percent or whatever the horrific rate is you, the money you're going to get back in three years is crap you, you've, gone, you've lost to inflation more value than you invested so you've guaranteed yourself a, to lose you'd be better off just shoving the cash under your mattress than buying a US bond so why is why are they still being bought at these preposterously insipid interest rates well it's a good question <laughs> yeah somebody obviously is being coerced to do it obviously the the, the, the bonds are being traded you know pressure to buy them is being um, created through artificial mechanisms so they'll create demand for the bonds by creating some sort of fraud you know some sort of system where like say for example the Freddie Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae's um, government owned stock the government will give you bond credit for um, purchasing that bad paper and so that creates pressure for bonds now you need bonds so you can uh, give them to these people for uh, a guaranteed FDIC insured investment opportunity <laughs> which is just a joke uh, but anyway so that's where the pressure is coming from is some sort of gimmick it's like the Chinese don't buy our bonds because they think they're a good deal uh, they buy them because they know they have to to negotiate their trade agreements uh, they don't get anything if they don't give us something and what they're giving us is two trillion dollars of bad paper they bought you know of uh, our bonds uh, some buying pressure but anyway there's no future pressure visible you know, like I said nobody would you, you wouldn't you wouldn't waste your money by buying uh, a dollar that you know has enough inflation built into it not to give you back anything and you're not getting any interest um, so anyway, then, then these artificially low interest rates have also created this phenomenon where companies are deliberately borrowing money really to uh, game the system because they can borrow at uh, these preposterously low rates uh, and uh, they can make more money on the capital uh, just even holding the capital uh, you know uh, you know they, it, it's it's uh, it would, you know the premium they have to pay to, to possess it is so minimal and the money they'll pay back the bond with will be fake uh, you know if you borrow money now if you borrow hundred dollars today and you only have to pay two dollars in interest on it to hold it for a few years the, the good news is you only be paying back in the future you'll be paying back only a hundred dollars in inflated dollars so if you if you have a company and you're getting price inflation built into your product so you're getting the uh, uh, levelized price you know the the new economy price you're getting a hundred and ten dollars for your product let's say versus a hundred dollars uh, you'll be making more money and therefore you can pay the hundred dollars which is only ninety dollars in real dollars so you're making ten dollars for just borrowing money I mean it's obviously these things are evidence of a system that can't be sustained 
their their completely backwards uh, functionality. You're lending money at a loss to a lender and to a profit to the borrower. Uh, I mean that that uh, that that right there is just evidence of an economy that's in big, big, big trouble. And you got to say something's got to change. You can't just do this forever. It's like the same argument you can make about putting it on the credit card. I suppose people have lived that way. And I guess as long as they avoid bankruptcy, it works. Uh, you know, maybe it gets a little inefficient when they're starting to pay, you know, huge interest rates. But let's assume they can keep their interest rates reasonable by refinancing, you know, by constantly finding a new buyer for debt to uh, give a better rate. any practical at all. So, this is a good test of my this camera. This is the best wind camera I have. It is really blowing. Um, yeah, so it's what's going to duplicate the run on the bank scenario? It's the run on the debt. So, the sun is try over here still. Um, and, uh, yeah, so what's going to create the run on the bank? You know, when is this debt going to be forced to realize itself, to cascade and turn all this, these assets people are holding into what they really are, which is useless, unpayable promises? Um, and so, yeah, there's no like savings and loan catastrophe where everybody shows up at the bank and says, give me mine. Uh, it's not going to happen from the common man. Uh, it has to do with the rich and when they run away. And so that's the question is, when do they run to hard assets? When do they run to some sort of ownership uh, that is immune to the vagaries of um, bankruptcy? So, I mean, you know pretty well, you know, the, the hard assets like food production and energy, those things are, don't have a hard bottom. They don't have a bottom like where they're used, they're worth nothing. They're not like every other stock that can turn into complete crap. Uh, so that's like the place to be, no matter what happens in the economy, there's certain pieces of ownership that have to recover their value, uh, and property would be one of those, land, and, uh, you know, farming production, and resources, you know, minerals, and oil, and other fuels, I suppose, and so those, the inflation in the commodities, and the basic things like food and stuff, it's got to show itself, because if I had a billion dollars, that's what I would be bidding up on. That's what I would be bidding for, is ownership of those hard assets. You know, a, a few thousand acres in Iowa, and uh, you know, some, you know, maybe some old oil wells or whatever. <laughs> you know, uh, they might be a little overpriced still, but that's the kind of thing you'd be looking at and saying, you know, what that will keep its value even in a desperate economy. Um, you know, and not have a, a liability. The thing you'd have to avoid is buying land like in places like this where it could be taxed, you know, because then you could be just taxed out of your ownership by, you know, desperate communities who can't find money anywhere. Uh, so, that's only catch, I suppose. Uh, oh, really far away. Um, so anyway, I said inflation is inevitable, partly because of uh, the fact that uh, the commodities are going to be bought, uh, and secondly, um, because the money itself is going to have to start. It's going to have to start replacing bonds with cash. 
eventually you're going to have to print cash to pay all these bonds when they come due because you're not going to have enough revenue coming in and uh, as soon as that happens you know no one's going to want to invest in anything uh, even the stock market will be a loser because even if it maintained its value over a three year period and stayed at 12,000 or some other dopey number um, that would be essentially losing money a lot of money if inflation goes high enough uh, and it just gets more and more uh, it just gets more and more preposterous too the you know if, if interest rates are kept artificially low and inflation rises uh, as it has in, in my opinion in the real commodity real world place um, you know, it becomes more and more the scenario where it becomes a, a borrower's advantage. And uh, you can make money by borrowing money, will become more and more uh, powerful. And uh, that will only drive it into the hole quicker. to think through it some more and whatnot and so forth yeah so until next time and such all right walking home so if you like, put a little ad on whatever i was just thinking about the knights of the round table i was thinking about the idea of a round table and what that represents in terms of equality and uh, balance and all those kind of good words. But there was a king, right? It was King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So I wonder if he sat at the round table. Um, but anyway, you know, just a table without a head and a tail. But it's just kind of funny what you think about with a successful life and being somebody who has, let's say, a table where people sit at it, and it's their table. They're at the head of the table. And uh, some might say, well, that's being a winner. And it's one of the, the, the peasants, uh, the people sitting at the table, then, uh, you know, you're not so much of a success. <laughs> and uh, it's like that in the economy. You know, there's the, the people that are controlling the table, uh, deciding what's going to be served for dinner at the table <laughs> and there's the, the people who just have to you know watch their P's and Q's and not get out of place or speak out of turn uh, you know disrupt the uh, flow uh, the conduct of the tabling <laughs> anyway so you know and you apply that to the economy and uh, but the, you know the problem is, is you know we've just we've we've turned people into something. You know the question is, is are they going to be willing to be what we've turned them into, which is essentially slaves to wage slaves, slaves to a, a rental contract. You know, uh, even a mortgage now is a it's a rent because people never bury people get buried under them and. Uh, it's, it's just another way of renting, <laughs> is to have a mortgage, uh, you know, mortgage to not own. Uh, but anyway, and uh, how do I want to make this applicable? But, but yeah, what's going to have value to the people holding the capital is the question. I mean, we got to understand what has value to us as consumers. You know, we want the niceties of existence a camera and an internet to put it, a video on and uh, you know a roof of some kind and some heat and food and basic stuff and some maybe some fancy clothes and a neat little hat and uh, we're in business and uh, you know so we know what to invest in and it's just basic stuff uh, but if we had surplus, you know, what would we do with it? 
and uh, that's what the, the rich was to consolidate more and more money. They can't really spend it realistically on themselves. There's a point where they sort of exhaust that potential, uh, and it just becomes such it becomes a waste that they don't even want because it's like you know owning a mansion and a yacht. Well, the truth is, it gets kind of expensive. You know, I don't have to purchase these things, but you have to maintain these things. And you have monthly bills, and they sort of don't earn their keep after a while. And, uh, you know, what the point do I want to make on that? Uh, but the point is, is, you know, what are they going to do with their surplus? They're not going to, like us, if we had the surplus, if we owned the IOUs, you know, we know, well, we'd be relieved of our debt. And so we wouldn't be paying that interest payment every month. And so we would have that much more income, 30% more value for our work, uh, or 40 or 80. <laughs> I mean, if you really add it up, the rich men are very expensive. It's the worst kind of welfare, the welfare we pay to the rich. Uh, in, in indulging their preposterous extravagance. Uh, but yeah, who's going to invest in us when we don't have money? When we're so poor and we're just working to pay off the bills? Um, who's going to have any incentive to create supply for our demand when, we're going to, when our demand is going to be tied to insufficient funds all the time. We're never going to be able to afford to pay for it. Uh, so I guess getting back to it, uh, the old uh, analogy of an individual with credit card debt, that's what we have as a civilization. We have borrowed from the rich, we've indulged the rich, we've protected the rich, They've gotten richer and richer, and now 3% of the people own 97% or whatever of the IOUs. They own the world, essentially. They own all this debt, or a big piece of it, 80% of it, whatever. And, uh, uh, and so I like the credit card thing. So now the, you're stuck with this huge debt. You've borrowed money to live. You've made the rich richer by doing that. And uh, but the point is, is you can't pay the bill. And how is that going to be realized? Are the rich going to realize it and stop lending you money? Uh, are you going to just realize it and say, I'm bankrupt, I can't pay the interest rates anymore, even if they're low, I can't pay them. It doesn't matter how low they are. I can't pay the principal, let alone the interest. Uh, not me personally, I'm metaphoring, as I never believed in debt. Uh, but anyway, so what do you do? When, when, how do we know when it's too much? Like if I was to have a credit card with an unlimited credit, uh, whatever you call that, uh, how high could I go before I'd have to go bankrupt? And uh, that's an interesting question. And the real question, I guess, is is how long can it last before there is a 30% interest rate on the U.S. government, before the U.S. government has to pay a premium for that debt, to maintain the debt. And obviously, we're nowhere near there because the U.S. government's not paying hardly any interest on debt. And it's doing it because it just keeps saying, I'll refinance. And it keeps refinancing with itself. So it's essentially borrowed the money from its, its own reputation or something like that. Uh, and everybody's going for it. So when do the rich say, oh, wait a minute, I'm getting, I'm getting caught in something that's just going to crash. I, I don't want to own that credit card debt because there's no way that bum can pay it. So why, why would somebody run to owning that? Like say somebody, if I had $100,000 worth of credit card debt, and uh, you know, who would buy it? Who would, who would buy that debt and say, 
yeah, that's a good investment because he'll be able to pay the interest and uh, he'll eventually pay the principal. Or he'll pay so much interest it won't matter. He doesn't have to pay the principal because he'll pay five times the principal and in interest over time. Because he'll never get out of the debt. Uh, well, I'm just saying, so that's... There seems that, that like there has to be a place where this goes into bankruptcy. Where it's just stated, the debt's bad, it's got to be dissolved, and uh, there's only two ways to do it. You either inflate your way out of trouble, that is...